Good morning, my name is Peter Shields and on behalf of AMX Scientific, I'm pleased to welcome you all to today's webinar, New Approaches to Air Monitoring, Why, What, Who, How. This morning's webinar will be presented by Paul Pickering, the Global Key Account Manager from Aeropol in New Zealand. Paul has vast experience in this area and I'm sure you will find his presentation very interesting and informative. I'll now hand over to Paul, who has kindly agreed to present from New Zealand today. Thanks, Paul, over to you. More than 7 million people are dying per year from air pollution. And in Asia, which is a little closer to home for us, that equates to 2.1 million people. So most countries around the world are responding. They want to see change, and that starts with good decision making. And good decisions require accurate information. The the other thing that's interesting about air pollution is it's not discriminate. It's not limited to developing nations or developed, but it's a global problem. So let's just talk a little bit about what current air monitoring exists. First of all, why do we do it? Well, at a very basic level, we want to measure the effect of air pollution on our health. So the epidemiological questions. And we're thinking not just for ourselves, but the next generation and so on. What kind of environment are we leaving behind for our descendants? At a regulatory level, we measure air pollution for compliance. And that obviously is involved in mitigation strategies, which local government and state governments and other agencies administer. And then at a community level, we want to measure air pollution to understand the effects of the exposure on people, on our way of life, on architecture, on all the other various elements that make up our society. And fourthly, uh, we report that data to the public in some form of air quality index or forecasting. And that's a, uh, becoming a growing need around the world as we become part of a more globalised society that people want more accurate data and more timely data so that they can make decisions about their own lives and families. Now, how do we currently do that? Well, at a very high level, we use, um, as many of you know, ambient air quality monitoring stations to provide continuous ambient air quality data. And as you can see in the illustration, these instruments tend to be quite large and bulky in the size of either a 40-foot container or 20-foot container. In some cases, they are mobile, can be moved around on a large trailer or truck. Characteristic of these instruments is high cost. They're expensive to operate and they're expensive capital items. They also require uh, space, so it's not so easy to deploy them and often we find that these instruments are deployed in areas that are not really representative of where people are living, playing and living their lives, purely because of the size and the logistical issues in installation. So they have a large uh, physical footprint that limits their deployment. A couple of other factors that we know about these stations is that they do consume um, high power um, in, the, in the region of six or seven kilo, uh, kilowatts, and uh, the people required to operate them tend to be very specialised. So it's an expert uh, technology to be uh, maintained. In this next slide, we just focus on why there is a need for alternative approaches. And historically, air pollution measurement was focused on the urban and regional air quality at the macro scale. And that's where the traditional use of reference stations, whether they be continuous automated stations or uh, passive samplers, was used at a macro scale to understand air pollution at the uh, larger or macro environmental level. How this has changed is that as technology has uh, improved and become cheaper and smaller, and uh, with the aid of uh, the internet and other tools for globalisation, there's become an increasing awareness of air pollution at a community level. So people who previously had no access to information are now asking questions about our environment and about the air pollution that may be affecting them. The other thing that is limiting um, change is the capital and operating costs reference networks. And this, particularly for a state or a municipality, and for many of the developing uh, world countries, that represents a significant capital and operating cost. And thirdly, there is a need for new and alternative approaches to monitoring air quality at the microenvironment. And by that we mean the area where people are walking, where they're playing, 
at community level in places where we've never been able to measure air quality in the past, but now people need need to see that information and understand what it means for them in their lives. To respond to these growing trends, various agencies around the world have responded with uh, new ways of thinking. And of course, one of the leading uh, agencies for air pollution is the US EPA, Environmental Protection Agency. In March of 2013, they presented a draft roadmap for next generation air monitoring. And while this is a very detailed uh, document, one of the key statements that they make in this publication is that current sophisticated, expensive ambient air pollution monitoring technology is not economically sustainable as a sole approach and cannot keep up with current needs. Now this statement was issued two years ago where it was very obvious with the way technology and society are changing that there is a need for a more sustainable approach to measuring air quality. In October of 2013, an article was published in the Environmental Science and Technology uh, magazine. This is a highly respected environmental publication. The article was entitled, The Changing Paradigm of Air Monitoring. Now this article was written primarily by uh, individuals in the United States Environmental Protection Agency. And this article focused on some of the new, new uses and applications for sensor-based technologies. And they identified four ways that new technologies could be used. One of them is to supplement the routine. We're focusing on sensor technologies that can now supplement or augment those existing networks. And in some places, may even substitute as a form of measurement. Sensor-based technologies are a way that we can bridge that gap between the reference networks and the community. A third way these application is to measure uh, enhanced source compliance monitoring. And we're talking about perimeter or fence line monitoring of industrial um, pollution emitters. And along with that, the study is done by uh, researchers and um, environmental consultants trying to understand the effect of an environmental impact assessment of an industrial activity. Sensor-based technologies are a way that we can uh, at a very lower cost, we're able to obtain information about the effect of any industrial anthropogenous activity. And fourthly, sensor technologies can be used for monitoring the personal exposures or the effects on our health at a more granular level. Given the size and lower cost and lower sophistication of these technologies, it allows a, a larger dispersion of technologies for measuring the effect on people. Just focusing back on uh, an Asia perspective, because this relates to what's happening in our part of the world. In uh, the Better Air Quality Conference in Sri Lanka in November of 2014, they released a landmark document, Improving Air Quality Monitoring in Asia, and it was a good practice guidance document. This uh, document was produced in uh, conjunction with the Asia Development Bank and the Clean Air Asia organization. Just a couple of key points that came out of this uh, publication is that there is a, a crying need for monitoring in cities in Asia. Now this would also apply to Australasia also. Many cities are, are under uh, spec with measurement um, points throughout their municipalities. They did note that there are investments being made in air quality monitoring networks and systems, but unfortunately many of these are not being sustained. So there is equipment being dumped, high specification equipment, but there's not resource to use the equipment properly. And so these countries and states are not getting the full benefit of their investment. They also made the point that with new technologies, um, complex remote sensors are now coming onto the market that can provide continuous and integrated multi-component measurements. So whereas in the past, it required a lot of uh, advanced technology to achieve single channel measurement. With smaller technologies, it is possible to uh, measure a wide range of pollutants in a smaller, um, smaller box or smaller technology. And one of the outcomes of this conference was encouragement at national and state level to invest resources to developing monitoring systems that use a range of monitoring devices. So rather than becoming 
totally reliant on traditional methods, whether that be passive samplers or continuous automated stations, there is a need to fill in the gaps with a range of monitoring devices. So that brings us uh, uh, to what is next generation air monitoring. We've seen that there's been an appetite around the world and uh, various agencies are at the forefront of trying to understand how that should look like. This slide shows how the US EPA have in a uh, uh, infographic style shown what the need is and how next generation air monitoring can look like. In one of their documents they have outlined a tier um, arrangement. Tier 1 is the entry level and that is a very basic sensor uh, information for education and public awareness through to tier 5 which is known as near reference. And you can see in this slide that we demarcated between the EPA reference station or European uh, norm station which have a very high price tag of anywhere from $150 to $300,000 and very high reliability in terms of precision and accuracy of the data. We compare that with the various tiers outlined by the US EPA. Tier 5 is near reference. We're expecting performance that's very close to reference station but is much more compact, uh, a much lower price point and can be used for networks, compliance monitoring, supplementary monitoring, surveying and research. Obviously the precision and bias are not on the same level as a reference station, but for the by far the most majority of applications, the accuracy and suitability is what's required. These types of instruments are being used by regulators, both at government and industry level, consultants and researchers. In the middle, we have what's known as the indicative measurement device. These are similarly used by government, consultants and researchers, but their application is more short term, such as hotspot monitoring or surveying or researching, to be able to do mobile studies where it's impractical to put a fixed uh, measurement device. These obviously have a much lower price point, but as a, a, a byproduct, the precision and bias is not going to be the same as a near reference station or a reference station. And then at the entry level, we have uh, a proliferation of sensors now on the market that can be used with various applications on phones, used by citizens, by schools, and they're primarily directed at raising awareness at uh, school level, at community level, and doing uh, low-cost research. And the price point of these can range from a few dollars to a few hundred. Again, the precision and bias is very wide on such a product. By the way, this uh, roadmap is available online from the US EPA um, website, and you'll see in this presentation I've put the link to the document that's used as a source for this slide. What does this mean for technology? Well, on this slide here you can see the existing versus emerging strategies that we're seeing around the world, and that includes Australasia. The existing technologies which are well known to most of us, we've seen them in our community, they consist of the large automated continuous monitoring stations, and the data reliability when they're well maintained is an A plus standard. We would consider this to be the gold standard of continuous air monitoring data. However, as can be seen from the size of the box, they represent the highest cost and they're not very easy to deploy. Below this, below the line, we have the emerging technologies. And we've used some pictures just to indicate what these technologies look like. Near reference is, as the uh, title states, it's a supplementary system of measurement. It's not designed to replace reference monitoring, but designed to supplement it. We're talking about devices that might cost three to five times less than a reference station, but the data reliability is of an A level. It's not the gold standard, but it's very close, and for most purposes, it's quite adequate. Below that, we have the indicative, and here, because of the price point, we're able to deploy many more instruments for hotspot monitoring, for conducting trend studies and even for environmental impact assessments, depending on the application. The data reliability would be a B grade. 
And at the entry level of the emerging technologies, we have what we would call citizen science. And these are the small, low-cost, cheap sensors that appeal to hobbyists, to schools, and communities. They want to get a snapshot of what's happening in their community. Now, we're seeing a groundswell of interest in air quality monitoring, starting from the, from the bottom and working its way up. This is pushing the line higher and higher, and to the point that agencies and industry are now considering near reference technologies as part of the future of their air quality monitoring strategies. This slide just introduces where Aeroqual, as a manufacturer and a pioneer in this space, fits into this roadmap. Aeroqual have been in existence for around 15 years. We specialise in near reference and indicative technologies in air quality monitoring. As you can see from this table, one of our cheerleading products is the AQM65 air quality station. And this consists of a product which is able to measure multiple gas parameters along with particles and meteorological parameters, including noise and solar radiation, etc. This instrument would be termed a tier 5 or near reference instrument. In some respects, the performance is similar or exceeds that of a reference station. However, it's using some new technologies which are not currently um, listed under the US EPA as a reference or designated as a reference method. We believe that will change in time, given the groundswell of interest in more measurement at lower cost. We have a smaller instrument which we call the dust entry or the dust profiler, and this is in our dust monitors range. It's uh, similar to the AQM65 in a robust enclosure designed for installation in ambient environments. And this instrument is primarily designed for measuring particles at uh, PM10, 2.5, PM1, or um, TSP. Other parameters can be measured. And then we offer a portable instruments, handhelds that can be used for measuring a, a broad range of single gases. In some cases, we offer dual sensors such as NO2 and ozone together, or a VOC, CO2, and CO together for indoor applications. This is a tier three indicative product. And at the very entry level, we manufacture central modules that are often used in research uh, projects for measuring things like ozone and are quite typically used on balloons, etc., for other studies. What I'd like to talk to now is a little bit about the AQM65 by, by way of introduction. The AQM65 is the successor to the AQM60. Now, currently there are well over 300 AQM60 stations installed around the world. And uh, earlier this year, we, we introduced AQM65 as a more modern successor to that instrument. And around the world, they've been deployed in networks and standalone uh, applications. In this slide, which I won't go into all the detail, um, because this presentation will be available to everyone who's registered as a PDF. However, it just lists some of the key benefits of this instrument the ability to measure multiple pollutants simultaneously, and added to that, environmental parameters. Being smaller, it's able to be deployed in many more applications than were ever possible with traditional methods. And by using modern interfaces to create a direct internet connection via the cloud, people are able to see data remotely in real time from anywhere. It's a modular instrument, so that um, aids in maintenance and repairs. It can be uh, fabricated for one application and then changed for another. But one of the key differences with this product is that the calibration of the gas modules is according to US EPA 40 CFR Part 53, which also equates to the EU method under 2850 EC. So the measurement or calibration is traceable to certified instruments. And we're not talking PPM level of detection, we're talking uh, PPB levels, ozone, NO2, NOx, and uh, below 10 PPB for SO2, H2S, and VOCs, etc. Some of the applications that uh, where this product is currently used include urban networks, uh, national monitoring networks in various parts of the world, roadside monitoring, industrial perimeter monitoring, 
and environmental impact assessments. In this slide, which again I, will, um, I won't talk to in high detail because it would take some time just to work through, but it's an inside view of an, a typical AQM65 station. So what we've tried to do with this infographic is um, reveal what's inside the box, so to speak. And you can see on the side that we have a calibration chamber. This is an option that allows remote calibration of the instrument. Uh, in, in much the same way that a US EPA station will have an automated calibration regime. Well, this calibration system is very similar. It allows remote calibration of the zero and the span for several of the gas modules. All of our AQM65 stations include an air conditioner and thermal management system. And the, the reason for this is it enables a very stable measurement platform internally, regardless of what's happening in the ambient environment from minus, uh, uh, minus 35 degrees up to plus 50 degrees Celsius. Just a review of what near reference performance means, particularly for this product. The instrument demonstrates a very strong statistical correlation to the reference method. We're not saying that it is the reference method, but the performance is extremely close. And we've got several studies which we're able to share with people just so you can see what the independent assessment of that performance is. The reason why we have um, a very strong statistical correlation is because primarily we use the same standard reference materials for calibration in the field as are used for ambient um, reference stations. That means the measurement is traceable, even at the point of measurement and even at post-validation. It's traceable to a reference standard. And that gives people a high level of confidence in the data. And thirdly, we're able to reliably measure pollutants to most of the international ambient air quality standards, which include the World Health Organization, the EU levels, and US EPA national air quality standards. In this slide, which is also very detailed, but it demonstrates the performance specification of the AQM65 compared to some of those international standards. And you can see that the, the uh, detection limit and the range of the AQM65 harmonizes with many of these international standards. So what this slide demonstrates is that this product is suitable for measuring the ambient levels of um, air pollution or standard criteria pollutants according to most of the international recognized standards in Europe, the United States, and the World Health Organization. When we think about the applications for a near reference system, we're talking about municipal networks where we can supplement or extend an existing network, where they can be used for mobile and hotspot monitoring, being able to move an instrument to a place where you wouldn't, pr wouldn't primarily be able to put a reference uh, equipment. And then there's a supplementary or special purpose monitoring of, of a industrial site but done by a municipality. Another key application is for industrial fence line or perimeter. perimeter. And we're talking about real-time monitoring that allows a plant operator, a health and safety environmental officer, to respond immediately to an exceedance because they have real-time data. In some parts of the world, that kind of real-time data needs to be passed on directly to an agency. And our equipment can do that through modern communication platforms. A third... Uh, a very popular application is for air quality consultants, allowing them to do environmental assessment um, studies, baseline studies, before a mine or mining activity or industrial activity is performed. And it's used as a tool for multiple client projects. So a, a consultant can use it on or deploy it on a, a larger number of projects, which reduces the cost of measurement. And finally, Universities and researchers, usually they have a limited budget, but they're looking for the highest quality of data. And this uh, product represents a very good compromise for them. And it's also used as a way of teaching students how to measure air quality because of the simplicity of the instrument and the practicality that allows them to educate people. In this slide, we just demonstrate how this product really is a, a near reference uh, instrument. For three months, it was co-located with 
a government operated Taledyne API US EPA uh, federal equivalent method uh, station. It was a three month study. What was interesting was uh, there were no calibrations, no field calibrations were done on the AQM60 station. And that was deliberately requested because we wanted to understand from the data what the drift might be over time for such an instrument. This was an independent assessment, it was not done by uh, Aerocol, it was done by an ISO 17025 laboratory. Now the full report is available, but you can see from the picture that the uh, Aerocol instrument was installed on the roof of the uh, government uh, air quality station, and from the, um, the bird's eye view, the location of the study was between urban residential, industrial and recreational and a roadside. So it represented a very complex um, air monitoring site. This was the data that we received back from the independent assessor. In the red you can see the federal uh, reference method and in the black is the Aerocol module performance. And this is over a period of three months. You can see in the correlation ratio that there was a very high correlation, statistical correlation of the data. Now please bear in mind that being a US EPA reference station, it was calibrated every month uh, by contract with the government. Whereas the Aerocol station was not calibrated at all, apart from a factory calibration before installation. So you can see over a period of three months, there was minimal drift, and that was without a field calibration of the instrument. Here's a similar uh, slide showing the ozone data for similar reasons. The red is the reference method, and the black is the Aerocol ozone module. And you can see, a ver again, a very close correlation between the two instruments. So before we move off that, what does this kind of data tell us? Well, it shows that this kind of instrument is very reliable and can be used for near reference studies and monitoring. And that's one of the primary applications for this instrument. Of course, the instrument, the data has to be easily accessible. The Aerocol uses a new program or operating system called Connect. It allows Wi-Fi, Ethernet and modem communication with the instrument. It allows the operator to understand the status of the instrument, to be able to configure it, to calibrate it, to update the firmware, to do diagnostics and to see data remotely. The communication is by RS-232 to a PC or to an internet uh, browser, to a tablet, a PC, um, Mac, Android or um, uh, I, uh, PC. In addition, we have a new program called Aerocall Cloud and this uses the cloud as a way of transmitting information from the instrument to a wider range of users. And uh, again, this is a cross-platform system that allows administration status, data uh, measurement and management configuration, calibration of the instrument can all be done remotely. Some of the other features that are coming out with cloud are SMS notifications and email alerts and this is a very low cost way of being able to communicate with multiple people uh, the condition of the instrument and also if there's been an exceedance on any particular channel. Here is a case study of a near reference network. In Dubai, if uh, many of you may have um, may have been to Dubai or you know where it is and uh, it prides itself on being one of the state-of-the-art cities of the globe. In 2020, Dubai will host the World Expo. Now Dubai has a population of just under 3 million and uh, in 2010 um, it awarded a contract to um, Aerocol for deployment of the um, ambient air monitoring network, 14 station network using compact Aerocol near reference um, mo uh, monitors. So this uh, network has been operating for um, a good part of uh, five years now and uh, it's been a much lower cost network for them and uh, has been operating very successfully delivering data for the municipality. Uh, the comment made by the munis municipality is that for a third of the cost of the traditional monitoring uh, stations, for that budget they were able to buy 14 uh, stations and deploy them. And uh, they have a website where you're able to actually drill down and see the air quality and air quality index 
for each of those stations that are currently in the network. Aerocall is very mindful that we need to educate and train operators and other stakeholders, not only in the use of the equipment, but also in understanding air quality data and what it means. So we're trying to do our part in educating the industry. We do that using our LMS, which is a learning management system, and it's an online system based on the Moodle platform. Now, some of you may be familiar with Moodle as a platform used by uh, various uh, universities around the world, such as Cambridge, York, um, Stanford, and so on. So we use the same platform to be able to teach technicians and operators as well as um, our distributors not only how the equipment can be used, but how to resolve um, um, and maintain the equipment and resolve issues and troubleshooting. So that covers the AQM65 as a product and as a near reference solution. We want to briefly move on to a real-time dust monitoring solution for measuring particulates. This slide, again, doesn't need much explanation. Particulate matter is something that penetrates the lungs and the bloodstream, depending on the size of the fraction, and is becoming one of the most uh, studied uh, forms of air pollution of all the compounds. The regulatory limits are typically total suspended particulate, PM10, PM2.5, and PM1. This slide just shows some of the typical sources of PM pollution. And in uh, Australasia, um, one of the biggest sources of PM2.5 is from fuel combustion and from solvents. PM10 is mostly from dust and fires. Now both PM10 and PM2.5 are regulated um, fractions in most parts of the world, whether it be from construction or from roadside or from vehicle emissions or from uh, burning of fossil fuels. Our solution for measuring this in real time is, is one of two. Firstly, we offer the dust entry. This is a single channel instrument for measuring PM10, 2.5, PM1, or TSP. What's unique about it is that it delivers continuous real-time data and has a huge onboard storage capacity using an embedded PC. With the newer technologies, we're able to offer a much wider range of communication options, whether that be via Wi-Fi, um, Ethernet, or modem using the GSM network. And it does also allow things such as email, SMS alerts, and exporting the data to FTP sites. It's a robust instrument, it's a secure instrument, it has solar irradiation shields, and it's also certified by the UK Environmental Agency under the MCERT scheme. Some typical applications include construction, industrial perimeter monitoring, roadside, baseline studies for EIAs, and research and consultancy. A similar product is the dust profiler. How this instrument differs, this is a multi-channel instrument that measures PM10, 2.5, PM1, and TSP simultaneously in one minute intervals. This has a, a, a more specific application in that the, the emphasis is more on data rather than the quality of the measurement. So it's ideal for measuring the aerosol profile. So it's used by air quality researchers for short-term surveys, for source apportionment and roadside monitoring, where you want to understand more about what's happening in the environment from receiving more data simultaneously. However, in many places, it's used as a way of simultaneously measuring PM10 and PM2.5 for supplementary regulatory purposes. Here we just compare the performance of the dust entry, dust profiler, with the reference method or reference equivalent method. And here we're talking about the BAM method, the beta attenuation uh, method, which is a um, EPA federal equivalent method. And here we compare the performance of two dust entries with PM10 sharp cut cyclones, which are operated side by side with beta attenuation monitors. And you can see the correlation is a very good correlation. The average between the, the BAMs and the dust entry units was a difference of only 3.25 uh, micrograms per cubic metre. So a very high statistical correlation between the instruments. Now incidentally, this uh, test was done independently for the purposes of achieving MSERT's 
uh, certification by the UK Environmental Agency. Where is this product used? Well, primarily it's used wherever there's an anthropogenous uh, uh, emission of dust, such as construction, waste, landfills, mining, transportation, cement plants, coal terminals, consultancies and researchers for measuring particulate emissions. It's easily deployed, it's light, it's relatively low power and can be moved from site to site. Here is a uh, case study using the dust entry for managing a coal terminal in Canada. And in this case, they created a network of three uh, dust entries. One of them because of its very remote, lo remote location on Prince Rupert Island had to run on a solar panel. So you see evidence of that. And the, on the mast above, you can see a uh, Visola uh, metrological sensor measuring wind speed and direction. Uh, it's measuring air temperature, relative humidity, uh, bar barometric pressure, and also rainfall using a sonic sensor. And we typically would, would integrate with our um, instruments various metrological sensors. So a full range of data is received so that people can make accurate decisions on where emissions are occurring from, what are the sources, and how they can improve the environment. As Ridley Terminal said, their priority was to measurably improve the environmental performance of the company, and one of the key areas of doing that was in um, mitigating air emissions. And they used our product as an early warning system for coal dust emissions. Here is another case study where prof dust profiles were used in the United Arab Emirates. In this case, there are about 80 um, quarries or crushes, rock crushes, in the UAE. And currently about 40 of those are using Aerocol products. So um, I'm glad to say we have um, a very good market share in the United Arab Emirates. But the reason for that is that the instrument is very reliable, it's very robust, it has solar shield protection, and uh, is able to be used in the very hot and dry, dusty cl climates in the Middle East, very similar to many parts of Australia. And uh, the instrument provides real-time alerts to the crushes, so the health and safety environmental officer is able to get a message on his phone. If there's been an exceedance in any particular area of the plant, he's able to respond there quickly. And uh, by law in the UAE, the real-time data from the instrument has to go to the Ministry of Environment and Water. This is a new regulation since the beginning of the year. So now there is complete transparency between the emissions that are occurring at the rock crushers plant and what the ministry is able to see on their own computer screens is the performance of the air quality management of those plants. In this case, one of the engineers said they were able to control the air quality at their site and comply with the regulations. And uh, we were able to deliver a very cost-effective solution using the dust entry for the rock crusher market. Again, Aerocol is very concerned about uh, training our operators and other stakeholders in the industry. We provide specialist knowledge using Moodle, which is a way of uh, transmitting the knowledge, and we update this knowledge regularly. It's not only how to use the instrument, but other trends that are happening in the industries and uh, in the measurement field. And uh, we invite anyone that uses our instrument as an end customer, they're able to register for this education free of charge. There is no cost attached, and it's just it's a matter of informing your distributor, informing the people at AirMet, and uh, we'll register you as a, a student for this program. There is actually uh, a formal um, qualification at the end, and the idea is that we're trying to upskill people in the industry, how to use the instruments, but also how to understand and mitigate air pollution. And that brings us to our final um, solution, an ultra-portable solution for air quality measurement. Aerocol has been uh, manufacturing portable instruments for measuring gases in the air for about 15 years. To date, there's more than 10,000 of these instruments in use around the world. What is uh, unique about them is the ability to measure a whole range of gases by interchangeable sensor heads on a single base. The base is able to do a zero and span calibration in the field or a bump test. It has a long life lithium battery and you can connect it directly to a PC to be able to download the stored data off the instrument. Where is it used? Well, being small and portable, it's used for hotspot monitoring, air quality surveys or personal exposure monitoring 
and short-term fixed monitoring networks also. Indoor air quality is another growing um, industry for this type of product. And what, uh, talking to people that use the product, they like the ergonomic feel of it. It's uh, quite lightweight. You have a carry case with a range of sensor heads in it. And it's even used by um, auditors, environmental auditors and inspectors to be able to do an on-site, very quick snapshot measurement of the air quality at a site. Some of the applications for indicative monitoring include um, outdoor air quality studies, being able to do a short-term study, uh, researchers, consultants, some people put them in, in a small enclosure to do a, a more longer-term study. And uh, Aerocol have uh, um, uh, introduced the first dual ozone NO2 sensor head. And by that we mean a sensor that um, accounts for the cross sensitivities between ozone and NO2. Now this is something that's very unique and you'll see that coming out in our product suite in the near future. Here we have a uh, case study where uh, the Series 500 has been used for an indicative study. This was conducted by uh, Sonoma Technology Institute Incorporated. This uh, was a study funded by the US EPA in California. And th they set up 21 um, ultra-portable Series 500 monitors to measure ozone. They put a small uh, solar panel and on a tripod with a, a little shield above the instrument and inside was a modem and um, the instrument was charged from the solar panel. Now they did this because they wanted to understand the, the ozone exceedances um, in the containment area in um, California around the city of Arvin. And this was something they couldn't do with the um, EPA federal reference stations because of the size and cost, etc. So they set up 21 of these uh, instruments in the valley. And uh, here is some of the data that came from Sonoma Technology. Again, you can see a very high correlation between the quality of measurement of the uh, portable instrument versus the federal reference analyzers. And we're talking about a, a cost difference of maybe 10 times the difference, and yet here is the quality of the data of the ozone measurement from this instrument. Aerocol is also concerned about certification of instruments and wherever possible we've tried to achieve this including M certs. Uh, we're also an ISO 9000 company and uh, we have quality um, assurance um, strategies to ensure higher, highest quality of product and uh, in the, the next year you'll see Aerocol achieving uh, more certifications around the world for our product. And finally we extend a very warm welcome to everyone that's registered today to come and visit us at Kazan's. So um, in Australia we're represented by Airmet Scientific and they have a booth, booth number 12 at Kazan's and we invite you to come along. So as a way of signing off, I'd like to um, thank you all for participating in this um, webinar. Thanks Paul for your time today. Thank you very much Peter. Look forward to seeing everybody and meeting up with the people as well. Thank you again guys.